On February 16th of 2014, a 26-year-old woman was found fatally stabbed in her home in Lackawanna, New York. But to figure out who did it, investigators would be forced to piece together a series of clues, including surveillance tapes, eyewitness reports, and a mysterious white phone. This is the case of Tequila Suter. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name is Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also being an archaeologist. These right here are the bones of a dinosaur that lived hundreds of billions of years ago. Joel, it's obvious those are just chicken bones. Stop lying. Uh, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. But anyway... Today, we're going over the case of a young woman who had evil lurking right around the corner without even realizing it. Tequila Latisse Suter was born on November 13th of 1987 in Oakland, California. As a child, her and her family originally relocated to Newfane, New York before eventually settling down in the nearby town of Lockport. It was here that Tequila grew up and attended elementary all the way through high school. The high school she attended is known as Lockport High. Following her graduation from there, Tequila soon began working at a nursing home as a dietary aide. Later, she then worked at a little place known as Happy Times Daycare. According to practically everyone that knew Tequila, she was a very kind person with a big heart. She absolutely loved working with children, and it was the sort of thing that she saw as her life's mission. Therefore, it wasn't a surprise to anyone when she packed her bags and moved to Lackawanna to take a job counseling young kids. This was a job that Tequila wound up being good at, and Lackawanna seemed like a decent place to live. Frequently, Tequila hung out with friends and family, and she had an excellent support system. Upon moving to Lackawanna, Tequila joined the Hills Tabernacle Church. Here, Tequila became a passionate and devoted member, and before long, she began working her way to becoming a minister. At the same time, Tequila had also made the decision to go to college, where she would be studying for a degree in criminal justice and child psychology. And as if work, family, school, and church wasn't a lot already, Tequila had even managed to fit some romance in her life as well. Her boyfriend's name was Damani Hall, and by all appearances, Damani seemed like a nice, polite guy. He had grown up in the area and attended church on a weekly basis. So all in all, everything in Tequila's life seemed to be going extremely well but some good things just aren't meant to last. On February 14th of 2014, Valentine's Day, Tequila was at the store attempting to buy something when her debit card got declined. Afterwards, she checked her bank account balance and discovered a strange series of charges. Multiple withdrawals had been made without her approval and it looked to be fraud. As a result, Tequila found it necessary to contact the local police department. Upon calling, the detective on the other end told her he was going to be gone for the weekend, so he would get back to her about it the following Monday. But two days later, police found themselves doing a much worse type of investigation than bank fraud. On Sunday, February 16th, one of Tequila's closest friends arrived at her house to pick her up for church. Every Sunday was sort of the same routine with Tequila and this friend. First, Tequila would get picked up and then they would go to church and start the morning off in a pleasant fashion. But on this particular day, when Tequila's friend showed up and knocked on the door, she got no response. Next, she attempted to call Tequila on her cell phone. But yet again, she received no response. In her gut, Tequila's friend knew that something was terribly wrong. 
soon, she called up her brother to have him come over and unlock the door. Tequila's friend's brother was employed by her landlord and owned a key to the apartment where Tequila lived. After showing up, the brother unlocked the door and made his way inside. But upon entering, he made an absolutely gruesome discovery. In her bedroom, Tequila was lying face down on the ground, surrounded by a massive pool of blood. Immediately, Tequila's friend's brother called the police and told them. Black one and 911, what's your emergency? Can I get a guy's emergency squad to 29 weeks there? What's going on? And by the time the police arrived, it was already too late. Investigators could tell by how dried some of the blood was that this tragedy had taken place many hours before. And this clearly wasn't just an accidental death. Tequila was viciously murdered in cold blood. Based on the evidence, this was personal. But the strange part about it was that despite all of the blood in this one room, there was very little blood anywhere else, at least visibly. So soon, police retrieved some blue luminol spray and began spraying it over various areas of the apartment. Quickly, the mystery of where the blood went was uncovered. In the bathroom next to Tequila's room, blue spots lit up everywhere, including the floor tiles, the tub, and the walls. At that point, police now knew that not only was Tequila murdered, but there was a thorough effort to clean up the evidence. One thing that was noticeably absent from Tequila's apartment was her white cell phone. The answer to that would be discovered soon enough, though. In the meantime, once Tequila's family all got the news about her sudden death, they were absolutely devastated. As we stated before, Tequila was extremely close to her family. To them, it was almost impossible that something like this could have happened, but it did. And so now, all they had left to do was to seek out justice. So next, in the official investigation, the authorities sent Tequila's body in for an autopsy. According to the coroner, this was one of the worst autopsies he had ever performed. The condition of Tequila's body was unforgettably bad and practically unrecognizable. She had been stabbed at least 39 times, mostly around the neck area. Other than this, the autopsy didn't reveal much, but the investigation team continued working in an orderly fashion so that way they could find any clues. One obvious way to do that is through surveillance footage. Now, despite the fact that Tequila's apartment wasn't in an area that had many, there did happen to be one in a store located next to where she lived. But when police reviewed the footage here, it turned out to be a dead end. So after that, they moved on to doing some interviews with people close to Tequila. One of the first people they interviewed was Tequila's boyfriend, Damani. Damani gave investigators a pretty specific timeline of events. First, he told them he had last seen Tequila on Saturday, February 15th. Damani claimed that their relationship was in a bad place by this point. Throughout the entire beginning period of that day, the two of them had been arguing back and forth. And at 4.30 p.m., he said Tequila finally had enough. She told Damani to gather his things and get out, and so that's exactly what he did. But at the same time, he also continued trying to work things out between them. After grabbing some of his belongings and placing them in a bag, Damani told Tequila he would be back the next morning to collect the rest. Once Damani actually left Tequila's apartment, it was about 5.30 p.m. Then, following his departure from there, Damani claimed that he headed down the street to a convenience store, bought some things, and exited the store. Next, he called up a friend and 
asked for a ride to a bus station. After his friend agreed and dropped him off, Damani then took the bus to his female friend's house. Here, he ended up staying overnight. During the same night, he claimed to have talked with Tequila over both Facebook Messenger and text. The discussion consisted of a similar argument to what they were arguing over before. Tequila let Damani know that she wanted to break up with him, and nothing he said or did would change that. Lastly, Damani claimed that it was the following morning on Sunday, February 16th, when he was at church, that he figured out about Tequila's murder. A friend of his had apparently tapped him on the shoulder, and together they said a prayer. And overall, that about sums up what Damani told investigators during his interview with them. But as for whether his alibi would hold up, that was still a question yet to be answered. Now, it's worth mentioning that during their interview with Damani, investigators found him to be reasonably empathetic and truthful. Some of the officers had even known him personally for a long time through high school sports, and he always seemed pretty polite. To give a bit of a background on Damani, on June 6th of 2010, he was given the Reverend Richard G. Stewart Memorial Scholarship. To have been eligible, he had to have at least a B average in school, have been accepted to a college, he was, be an active member in his church, and also active in community service projects. Damani was also on the student council in school. He was a varsity basketball player. He was on varsity track and field, and he received a ton of awards and accolades growing up. Damani went to two colleges. One was called Alfred State College, and here he was going for a degree in computer-aided design, and the other was Erie Community College, where he studied psychology. But when investigators proceeded in their investigation, almost everything Damani told them held up. First, they checked the surveillance footage from the store he went to. Here, video footage was in fact caught of Damani entering the store carrying a white plastic bag and a black backpack. And like he claimed, he bought a few items and left. Next, the investigative team moved on to retrieving footage from the bus Damani claimed to have ridden to his friend's house. Here, they encountered a bit of a delay, however. Evidently, it was going to take a few days before the company that owned the bus could access the footage and send it to them. So in the meantime, police looked into Tequila's phone records. These records corroborated exactly what Damani said in his interview. The two of them had been fighting over text and appeared to have been in the process of breaking up. Now, when the footage ultimately came back from the bus, it showed Damani getting on the bus and getting off at the same stops and same times he claimed. Therefore, based on all of the evidence collected so far, it appeared to the authorities that Damani's alibi was legitimate but he wasn't out of the woodwork quite yet. The last thing they had to make sure of was whether Damani actually spent the night over his female friend's house. Soon, they had Damani's friend and her cousin agree to an interview. This cousin was also there on the same night Damani came over. During the interview, Damani's female friend and her cousin corroborated his claim of coming over and staying the night. They also said that when he came over, he brought with him a black backpack. However, unlike in the surveillance footage, the girls claimed that Damani hadn't brought over a white plastic bag. So then, where was this white plastic bag? Well, that was a good question. Investigators asked the girl what else Damani had brought with him on that day. According to them, he had two cell phones with him. One of the phones was white, and the other one was black. When officers heard this, it set off alarm bells in their heads. Up to this point, police had still been unable to recover Tequila's white cell phone. So shortly after questioning Damani's friends, they brought him back in to have another discussion. 
During this second round of questioning, Damani was asked about exactly how he gained possession of the white cell phone. According to Damani, he had picked it up off the ground near the bus station, but it didn't work, so he threw it away. Now suddenly, there was a pretty big contradiction in Damani's story. Because while he was claiming to have thrown it away, the girls he was with on Saturday night said he was using it all night. At this point in their interview, police were convinced Damani was probably their guy, but they still didn't have any definitive proof. Now one item he did have with him on the surveillance footage that he didn't have with him by the time he got to his female's friend's house was the white plastic bag. Investigators figured if they could find this bag, it might also hold some evidence proving Damani to be the killer. Not long after finishing his second interview, investigators searched every trash can and dumpster on the bus route Damani took. Additionally, they checked around Tequila's apartment. However, nothing was found. So next, they searched in the trash behind Damani's female friend's house. And it was here that they finally found what they were looking for. Inside the trash, there was a white plastic bag and inside the plastic bag was a series of items, including two knives, a disposable mop head, some of Damani's own clothes, and Tequila's jacket, all of which had dried blood on them. And as soon as this was discovered, on February 27th of 2014, Damani Hall was arrested and charged with the murder of Tequila Suter. The following year, in 2015, he was then sentenced to 20 years in life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2034. As for what actually happened on the day of Tequila's murder, well, it's thought that it may have gone a little something like this. On the day of February 15th of 2014, Tequila confronted Damani about making a series of charges using her bank account. After doing so, the couple got into an intense argument and began fighting. Then, before long, Damani became so enraged that he took out a knife and stabbed Tequila multiple times, ultimately killing her. Afterwards, he freaked out and began trying to figure out what to do. Thinking quickly, Damani got some cleaning supplies and cleaned the area around the murder scene. Next, he took Tequila's phone and went out to the store before ultimately ending up over his female friend's apartment. It was then here, of course, where he threw away the plastic bag of evidence before heading inside. And overnight, he used both phones to send a series of texts back and forth, making it look like he talked to Tequila. A perfect plan, except for the fact that it was a horrible plan. Anyway, that's the end of that. After this all happened, in 2020, Damani Hall was allowed to have a TED Talk, and they posted it on their official YouTube channel. In their description of the video, they wrote, Through poetry, Damani takes us on an emotional journey leading to his incarceration, but ultimately to his faith. Damani Hall is a man of integrity and a great encourager to all people. He has attended Alfred State College and Erie Community College, where he studied psychology. Among his many accomplishments since being incarcerated, Damani is now a clerk in Attica's industry department and an active member in the Youth Association program. He loves sports, reading, and writing poetry. This talk was given at a TEDx event using the TED conference format, but independently organized by a local community. And I personally find that description repulsing and a complete misrepresentation of his character. Damani was not just some sort of scholar that went to college, and he is definitely not a man of integrity and a great encourager to all people. He literally stabbed a woman over 39 times, murdering her in cold blood. Men with integrity don't do that. The definition for integrity states that it's a quality of being honest and having strong moral principles or a moral uprightness. Murder is not moral. 
That's so ridiculous that they'd put him in that sort of frame. But Tequila Suter was an extremely kind, hardworking woman with a loving family and friends. The impact she made on those around her was amazing, and she's greatly missed. It was an honor to be able to tell her story. Rest in peace to Tequila. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please like and subscribe because it's all we do. I also have an all-exclusive Patreon if you're interested in that. There's a bunch of tiers to choose from, and the third one allows for you to see a Patreon-only video, and that tier and the second one allow you to have your name at the end of each High Time Crime video. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.